so excited for this series and, and my heart is like really filled with faith and expectation that God is going to really do something amazing because, because of the God we serve. Because a God we serve is, is alive. A God we serve is good. A God that we serve is kind. He's compassionate. A God we serve is victorious in every area of life. Amen. And we have a God who's not only all of those things, but He's a God who's on our side and a God who gives us the victory. And that's why the Psalm says this, Psalm 48 says this, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. When we realize how great God is, it's so easy to praise Him. It's when you don't know how great he is, it's difficult to praise him. If I had to walk past you and you didn't know that I was the best in the world at something, you would treat me as an ordinary citizen. But if I was Cristiano Ronaldo walking in here, you'd be all going, ah. Oh. Yeah, we serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The Bible says he is great and greatly to be praised. Can I hear a praise today for the King of Kings? And so this week, I'm, I'm starting up a new series, which is going to lead to our more offering uh, on the 4th of November. It's a weekend in our church where we bring an offering that's above and beyond, where we as a church go above and beyond to see God's kingdom advance, to see the work of God move forward. It's not an offering given to a man. It's an offering given to the work of God. And, uh, and it's, come, it's a time where we come and we give our finances. And it, it involves money. It does really involve money. But it's more than just giving money. It's actually, it's actually a time where we say, God, our desire and our heart is to see you to continue moving in our church to see you continue moving in people's lives. That God, I want to be a part of something that's eternal, not something that's temporary. And it's a time where we, we come with an expectant heart. Um, and a heart that is receptive and sensitive to God speaking to each and every one of us. And so this year, as I was preparing for more offering, I was saying, God, you know, when I've just done a money series. And now we're going to be talking about giving into your kingdom. God, I really need you to speak to me about what you want me to speak to the church about. Because God, I know that if you were here in person, they would give. But it's me, Lord. So I need your help. I want to hear from you. And I want to be sensitive to what you're speaking to us as a church. Because we as a church, and what I would really pray as a leader of this church, is that I never do something out of my flesh. That I never do something because I thought it was a good idea. But I want to hear from God so that God can, can speak into your life, speak into our life as a church and move us forward. And as I was thinking and meditating on this and asking God, I, I believe I got this thought from, from the Spirit of God that really triggered off this series. And this thought came into my mind and, and the, uh, the idea about how we are living life right now. If I had to ask you how you're living life right now in this room, many of us would have different answers. Many of us would have different experiences, but most probably we would all probably have a similar outcome, is that we're not living it to the fullest. And, and so I got this idea and this thought that how would, or what would I do differently, or how would I live my life if I knew that when I came to the end of my life, that for every day I lived, God had set pieces in place for me to win. That God had orchestrated every day, and every day the decision I made to move closer to the will of God, God moved something in the atmosphere of my life that I can't see that is causing me to win. And that if I had to get to the end of my life, which we are all going to get to the end of our life, that if I had to get to the end of my life and realize that the war has been won, so that I live my life from a place of victory, not fighting for victory. And this thought came to my mind, and, and I started to think, how would I live? What would my conversation be like? What would my thoughts be like? What, what, what would the conversations, well, that every word spoken in faith, that God could actually do something, that God would bring it to pass? How, how would I, I walk and believe God for the impossible in my life, knowing that God is on my side and that the war is won and that every decision I make 
God has already set up a piece and put other pieces in place for me to be victorious. That's why the scripture, I love the scripture, which just kind of helps us understand that, that we are serving a God and we're on a team that is not trying to win, but we are on a team that has won. And even though we have won the war, God gives us daily battles so that we can be victorious and that we can experience His blessing in our life. And so the scripture that I came across was 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8. It says this, that none of the rulers of this age understood it. What didn't they understand? They didn't understand who Jesus was. And you know, it's so true when I was thinking about this passage is that many of us know Jesus. Many of us have a relationship with Jesus, but we don't have a full comprehension or an understanding of how great he is. Because look what it says. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So like if they knew who Jesus was, and that after his resurrection, he would defeat every enemy, they would not have crucified him. And look what it goes on. It says, however it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. This scripture just tells us right there and then that we cannot see what God has. We can't understand what God has. We haven't even heard all that God has for us. And you know, right through scripture, we read about this amazing power of God. And the scripture is telling us is that, that if the enemies of God had known who Jesus was, is that they wouldn't have crucified him. They wouldn't have taken his life. You see, the reality is this. When creation started, God had a specific plan and purpose for man. That God created man for relationship. And so every time God made a move towards humanity or do something for humanity, the enemy had a counter move. So God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create this earth, and I'm going to create mankind for relationship. The enemy stepped up and said, I'm going to destroy this relationship that God has created. So there's this, like in the heavenlies, there's this cosmic chess game going on. That every time God makes a move, the enemy makes a counter move. When God says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build relationship, the enemy says, I'm going to break relationship. When God says, I'm going to come down and, and have fellowship, the enemy says, I'm going to bring sin into the world so that fellowship can be broken. So there's this continual moving in the heavenly realms, amen? The devil said, I'll break it. God says, I'm going to give man a free will. The enemy says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pervert man's free will. And so there's this move that's going back and forward. Devil, the God says, I'm going to set them in a sinless environment. The enemy says, I'm going to cause sin to come in and destroy the environment. Then God says, you know what? Because man has sinned, I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice an animal and the blood is going to cover their sin. And then the enemy said, you know what? I'm just going to get them to focus on their own life, focus on their own desires and live in sin continually. And then, and then they, that was his move. Then God said, you know what? I'm going to make another move. And God says, I'm going to send a savior. And his name is Jesus. And the enemy says, you can send a savior. His name is Jesus, but we will crucify him. And so the enemy on the day of the crucifixion thought he had won and gave him his best move. And his best move in the natural looked like the greatest move. But God still had another move. And the move was this, is that even though it looked like it was over, the Son of God went into the grave, he went into hell, and he stole the keys of death. And he defeated the enemy. And God said, hey, 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 I still got another move. And I'm going to move and my son is going to rise. And he declared from the heavenlies, checkmate. And here's the story. The series is called Checkmate. Because as long as the king is still standing, you still have a move in your life. As long as the king is still on the board, you have a future. It doesn't matter what the enemy brings against us. It doesn't matter what comes up against us. The king is still on the board. And life has told you, you have had your final move. The enemy has lied to you and said, you know what? Your past is gone. Well, I'm yet to declare today in a Pentecostal way that the king is still on the board. And he's still standing in Jesus' name. And today I really believe that, church, that the enemy is trying to convince people that there are no more moves. That there are no more moves. That you've had your greatest move and your greatest move was not good enough. And today I want to I encourage you, the king is still standing. He's still on the board. How? How would you live your life? 
if this revelation got into your spirit, that you still have another move. That the king is still on the board and he's won the war. And every day he's waiting for you and I to step up. And here's this, this, the title of my message this morning. It's your move. It's your move. You have a decision to make. Am I going to move? And this is the life of Joshua. And we're going to look at the story of Joshua building up to more offering because I think it's such a powerful story. In Joshua chapter 1, we read the story of Joshua and it says here in verses 1 of chapter 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is eight. That means he didn't, not that he didn't have a father. His father's name was just Nun, okay? okay. <laughs> Moses, some of you will get that later, okay? <laughs> Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you. Everybody say no one. They will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Let me just declare this to you today. This is not a story to a man named Joshua. This is a story to the church of the living God. Amen. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful in everything you do. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you. What an amazing promise. What an amazing inheritance for Joshua and the children of Israel. God says to Joshua, every place where you put your foot, that will be your land. Every place you go to will become your territories. God says, I will be with you. And I believe what God is saying to Joshua in this passage is that as he goes out and every place he puts his foot geographically will be the possession of the land will be his. And I believe what God is saying to you and I is that there are areas in our life that God wants you and I to possess. And they may not be geographical areas. They may be areas in our mind, areas in the workplace, areas in our relationship. That God says, if you are willing to move, I will be with you. And as you take a step into that marriage, or as you take a step into that barren ground, what will actually happen is I will do something amazing and I will give you those things that have been trying to defeat you because the whole idea of the story is, is that Israel had an enemy, the Philistines from the land of Canaan. And they were preventing them from inheriting the promise of God. There is a truth that you and I need to settle in our heart is that we have an enemy and he's trying to prevent us from possessing the promise of God. What is the promise of God? Peace in your marriage, abundance in your finance, health in your body, sound mind. Come on. There is an enemy that is trying to destroy our lives like that. And God says, if you move, I really believe what God is saying is that I will give you the land you move on to. And I believe God is speaking a message to the church with such clarity and such urgency in this time, more than ever before, that it's our time to move. That it's our time to move for our church, for us ourselves as individuals, that God is waiting for you and I to move. You see, the truth is this, is that God is calling you and I to move. God does not want you and I in the same place as what we were last week, last year, or a decade ago. Throughout Scripture, we see that men who moved with God possessed the land. Men who moved with God inherited the promise of God. Whenever we move with God, what happens is God moves with us. And I believe that God is calling each and every single one of us. And it's not just about territory and it's not just about possessions. That God is calling you and I to take a move closer to Him. A move closer to Him and a move to do His will in our life. And as we do that, we're going we're gonna to experience what God has for our life. You see, life 
as we move, life is like a chess game. Every time we take a move for the things of God, the enemy gives us a counter move. Like you start tithing, and suddenly there's some financial commitments and bills that you've never had to pay. They just come up. Like you start believing for healing, and then you suddenly you feel pains in your body. Because whenever we take a move in faith, the enemy tries to instill fear. And so we got to keep on moving and keep on trusting God. Amen. And so I really believe that God wants you and I to continue moving. And what I realized in my life is that, is that what God is and who God is in our life is that God often does the greatest work in the toughest hours of our life. And if you're in a situation or a season where it's tough, I want to encourage you, just keep moving because God has a plan for your life. He has a move that he hasn't revealed yet. Amen. And so we read the story and we look at the life of Joshua and we think, this is amazing. This is so easy for Joshua because like Joshua, he knew Moses. Joshua, God spoke to him. And we think, man, this, only, this is only really applicable to the life of Joshua. Um, and sometimes in our life, this is what happens to me when I read the Bible, is that I read the Bible about these guys and these stories. And I look at my life through their life and I think to myself, if I was them, it would have been different for me. Like if I was the pastor of the church, I wouldn't have the challenges I have. Come on, people say that. Like I went to the shop once and I was talking to people. Do you ever have marriage problems? I said, oh yes. Do you ever have challenges financially? Oh yes. You've gone quiet on me. I went to the shop once and I was wearing shorts and somebody said to me, you wear shorts? I said, I know these legs are holy. But the truth is, is that we think if, if I was in someone else's shoes, it would be different. I want to tell you right now, God's got his lane for your life. He's got his plan for your life. And what God has done in the past for other people and what he's doing in someone else's life, he is not a favor. He doesn't favor people. He can do it to any person who lives in faith and believes him in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Joshua, Joshua is like living his life in Egypt. So Joshua, he's born in Egypt. He's lived his life in Egypt as a slave. And, and, he, and Moses comes up onto the scene and says, hey, God has told us we're going to inherit a promised land. And he's going to deliver us from being slaves. And we're going to go into the promised land. And so Joshua hears this. And, and so hope get, rises up in him. And he starts to believe that this is true. But then he goes for 40 years with Moses through the wilderness. He spent 40 years traveling in the wilderness, seeking the promised land. What should have been a two-week journey ended up being 40 years. Let me, let me just say this in, for your life and for my life. Wilderness is a part of life. But just because it's a part of life, it's, it's a place for preparation, not a place of destination. And so Joshua's thinking, man, I've, we, we've heard the promise of God. We've been to church. We've even sang songs about God. We've seen God do miracles. But we've never entered into this promised land. And so God's conversation with Joshua, he says to you, hey, Joshua, it's time for you to move. It's time for the people to inherit the promise of God. And he says, you know what? I, I want you to move because I've set up some battles for you so that you can win. I've already won the war, but I'm going to give you battles that you're going to fight here on this earth to strengthen your faith, to cause you to believe, and so that you can in inherit the blessing and enter the promised land. And so what happens is the people of God become so comfortable. So think about it. When you live 40 years in the same place, you become comfortable. So the people have become so comfortable with the promised land, so comfortable and complacent, living in a place of mediocrity, and God says to them, this is not my plan for your life. And I believe that our God, our God is challenging you and I in this room this morning and our church not to become complacent in our faith, not to become so conformed to where we are, not to, not to stop moving towards Him. You see, God doesn't want us to live in comfort. Because nothing grows in comfort. In actual fact, in comfort, you get weaker. And God wants you and I to step out. God, we need to take a step towards God because a step towards God is a step out of comfort. Whenever we step towards what God has for our life, it's going to challenge our comfort. And a step out of comfort is a step towards destiny. And if we're going to ex experience all that God has for our life, church, we got to get out of comfort. And we got to say, God, I'm taking a step towards you because a step towards God is a step out of comfort. And a step out of comfort is a step towards destiny. And God doesn't want us to not fulfill the destiny that he has on our life. You know, each time in my life 
where I've gone to a new level, whether it be my relationship with God or a new level in my own personal living, it's required me to step out of comfort. It's required me to change what I usually do and do something new. You know, whenever God wants to take you to a new level, He wants to break the ceiling of limitation at the current level. And often at the ceiling, where the ceiling of your current limitation is, there is a giant that God wants you to stand up and confront. It's like Mario Brothers. Like if you're going to get to the next level, you've got to kill the dragon at the end of the stage. So some people are like, I want to stay on this stage. I want to just run around and collect all the little mushrooms and all the little treasures on this stage. Where God's like, no, no, I've got more on the next level. And God's calling us as a church that we've got to step out in faith and believe and take a move towards Him. You see, God had more for Joshua and Israel. And I believe that if God's going to do more in our life, more in our church, He's going to do which what He desires to do. It's going to take you and I to get used to being stretched in life. Come on, we don't like to be stretched, but your growth is in the stretch. Your strength is in the stretch. Amen. Don't go quiet on me because it's cold. You see, Joshua had to prepare himself for a new season. A new season with new responsibilities. And with every new season and responsibilities, let me tell you this. With every new season and responsibilities come different voices. And Joshua had to deal with the voice of fear. You see, for 40 years, they'd been walking around. And, and let me just ask this question. Has anybody ever been afraid in the room? Like the rest of you? You're amazing. Like we all are afraid of something. And often the thing that we're afraid of is the thing that's stopping us from progressing in life. Like if you're afraid to ask a girl out, try guess what? You're not going to get married. If you're afraid to go for the interview, you're not going to get the job. And so Joshua is like, God, I know you've got all of this for us, but Lord, I'm leading a generation of people of children whose parents just complained all the time. A generation who never ever believed they could get into the promised land. God, I'm, I'm leading a generation of people now. You're asking me to do something that I've never done before. And so Joshua has to deal with the voice of fear. We can deduce this from the passage where God says to him continually, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid. Now, listen, when God says, do not be strong, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid, it's not because they have peace. It's because they lack in it. And God says, come on, it's time to move. But you've got to be strong and courageous and you can't be fearful. Because if you're going to be fearful, you're going to miss out the promise that God has. We all have something that we're afraid of. I was looking, thinking about fear and all different kinds of phobias because we all have some kind of phobia. And I came across these different phobias, which I thought were quite funny. The first one is this uh, garescophobia. It means the fear of growing older. That's happening to you right now, okay? <laughs> it's the fear of growing older. The next one is bromidrophobia. Bromidrophobia. It's the feel of smelling bad. Come on. That person could be next to you right now, amen? <laughs> I think this one's so funny. It's... Uh, Sesquebedelophobia, which is the fear of long words. I just think that's so funny. <laughs> we all have something in life that causes us to fear. The truth is, that's the truth. It's not what we're facing that's causing the fear. It's the consequences that give us fear. I'm not scared to step out. But I'm scared of what will happen if it doesn't work out. And so we have different kinds of fear. For some of us, maybe this, this might be a little bit true for us, is that we have the fear of loss. So you might say, I don't have the fear of smelling bad or growing older or long words. But we all in this room might have the fear of loss. I've worked so hard for this. If I have to do this now, I can't afford to lose this. We all have the fear sometimes at certain times in our life, the fear of failure. Let me just say that failure is not a death sentence and it's not a final destination. In actual fact, failure teaches us how not to do it the next time. Okay? And so we have the fear of rejection. What happens if I do ask? Or what happens if I do step out and I get rejected? We have the fear of rejection. Then we have the fear of the unknown, which I think Joshua must have battled with. The fear of unknown. I don't know what's going to happen if I do that. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how it's all going to work out. It's the fear of the unknown. Some of us have FOMO. 
fear of missing out. Right now, you are missing out. Because you, yeah, you could have been somewhere else. People who are not here are missing out on what's happening here. Wherever you are in life, there is FOMO. <laughs> but you know what you need to know this morning, church, is that God does not work through fear. In actual fact, fear is the tool of the enemy. In actual fact, fear lives in the domain of the enemy. God is not a God of fear, but He's a God of love. You see, the devil works through fear. Fear is the enemy's weapon that will paralyze your potential and your purpose. And I realize this in my life, and I think this is true of many of us in this room, is that there is fear in the key areas of our life. And fear will cause you to not move forward. Fear will cause you to step back and never receive the promise that God has for your life. Fear will cause you to think small. Fear will cause you not to trust God. Fear will cause you to be the way you are for the rest of your life, where God has deposited so much more potential in you for you to accomplish all that He has for your life. The devil is a liar, and he intimidates through fear. That's what he does. Like he said to Eve, if you don't eat this, you won't have knowledge. Like he intimidated her. You can be like God, but you're not like God. You can be like him. Let me tell you right now, the devil is a liar and the weapon he uses is fear. He uses fear to stop us from possessing what God has for our life. And today I declare that we will not be a church. We will not be a Christ follower that is riddled with fear, but we will be men and women who believe in God. Men and women of faith that says that if God says it, it doesn't matter what the enemy says in Jesus' name. John 8 says this, John 8, 44, it says, speaking of the devil, when he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of all lies. He's the father of lies. Let me say this, church, don't miss out on your destiny because of fear. You see, my friend, fear will cause you to stop reaching out to your destiny. There is so much destiny that God has deposited in each and every single one of us. That's why the enemy uses fear to stop us. There are some men and women here that God has put his hand on your life to step out into a bigger business arena and a biggest world, but you are riddled with fear because you don't know what will happen. You will never know unless you take a step of faith. For some of us in this room, we're like, we're riddled with fear when it comes to our health because the enemy is saying, your family died of this, your grandfather, your father, and now you're thinking, now I'm next in line. And so I'm not going to step out in faith in believing God because that is my lineage. I want to tell you right now, when you were born into the body of Christ and in, under the blood of Jesus, you got a new family line. You got a new bloodline. There is, there is nothing that's stopping the power of God in your life. Let me say this, miracles don't happen in the realm of fear. Miracles happen in the realm of faith. And the enemy tries to put fear on each and every single one of us. He tries to stop us. He starts to paralyze us. And maybe you say, you know what, I don't have fear. Let me just tell you some of the symptoms of fear. Number one, anxiety. Worried about everything. Doubt. Discouragement. Low energy. Apathy. Not enthusiastic about life. Giving up. But I want to declare to you this morning, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Let me tell you, fear does not come from God. Every time fear wants to take over your life, you've got to realize it comes from the enemy. It comes from the father of lies, not from the father of God. Amen? It, comes from, it does not come from heaven. It comes from the enemy. You know what? I need to make a decision in my life. I can accept the lie of the enemy and live in fear, or I can accept the word of God and live in faith. You see, when fear comes knocking on the door, you need to realize that God gives you power to overcome fear. He gives you a sound mind to overcome fear. When fear tells you you're not going to make it, my God is for me. When fear tells you that sickness is a part of your family, in His presence I am healed. When fear paints your future, God knows the plans I have for you, says the Lord. When fear it tells me you're not going to make it. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. When fear says financially, you will be broke. My words, God's word says, Jehovah Jireh is my provider. I've got to realize that, that fear is stopping me from reaching all that God has. 
That fear is stopping you. It's holding the church back. And the enemy, we got to declare today that fear will not be our portion. Because look what Romans 8 says. The spirit you received does not make you slaves. So that you live in fear again. Rather that the spirit you received brought about the adoption to the sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. This is such an amazing passage because the Roman church... The people in Rome would have known this. The church in Rome would have known this because in Roman culture, what would happen is a very wealthy man or a very wealthy family, if they did not trust their sons and daughters, what they would do is they would, they would, they would employ slaves to serve them. And if they would identify a slave that, that was of good character, that was strong, that, a character, that had the character to manage life, what they would do is they would, they would adopt them into their family and that fa- they would become an heir to the inheritance. Well, God's word says, you know what, I've adopted you into my kingdom. So you don't have to live in fear. Now you get to possess what my kingdom has for your life. And I want to encourage us this morning, let's not live in fear. Let's live in faith in Jesus' name. You see, fear, this is how fear works. I'm going to put a diagram up, okay? The diagram of fear, the first thing is that we realize that fear is rooted in lies. It's rooted in lies. Because you don't know what's going to happen if you actually do it. But the devil tells you. This is what's going to happen. You see, the next thing that what happens is when you live in lies, doubt starts to set in. And then you start to doubt the promises of God. Eve, the enemy came, lied to her, tried to deceive her, and then she started to doubt God. She started to doubt the word of God. And as a result, she she bought into the fear, and then she felt rejection. And this is what happens. Fear always leads to feeling rejected. But you know what? Faith... Faith is this, that faith is rooted in love. Because the Bible teaches us that perfect love casts out all fear. You see, it's not faith that casts out fear, it's love. When you know that God loves you, you don't have to be fearful. You know when God is on your side, when you know it's checkmate, you don't worry about the future. See, what love does then, faith does is this, is it leads to truth. You know, truth is such an important thing. Truth You see, faith is not denying your circumstances. A lot of people have taught us, just don't worry about your circumstances, just believe in Jesus' name. No, no, what faith is, faith brings truth. Faith says, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm facing. This is where my relationship is. This is where my finances is. This is where my business is. Faith does not cover the truth. Faith reveals the truth, but then shows us a higher truth. That even though this is where I am, I can believe in God because why? It's checkmate. And I can believe that he's on my side. And then what happens is it leads to the next stage, which is hope. There's not a believer in this room that should not be living with the spirit of hope. There's not a person in this room that should not be walking out thinking that tomorrow is going to be the greatest day of your life. That this week, it can be the best week in business. Why? Because we are rooted in faith, which is rooted in love, and it has truth. It may not look good right now. It may not feel good, but I've got hope for tomorrow because I'm rooted in Christ Jesus. Joshua had to deal with this in his life. God says to him, be strong, be courageous. And Joshua, Joshua had every reason in reality. You see, the fact that the reality is, is that things didn't look like they were playing in Joshua's favor. See, Joshua, the truth is, is that he's never done this before. He's never led a nation. The truth is, is that there was a city that he had to go into that had giants. He had been there before and seen the giants. There were giants that he would have to face that were bigger than him, larger than him. The truth is he doesn't have a nation that is used to war. And so in the natural, everything looked against him. You see, the truth was is that the previous generation failed to enter the promised land. So these thoughts are going through Joshua's life. We've never been there. I've never done this before. I've never led my, my own business. I've never been in a marriage that's successful. I've never been able to raise good children. Joshua's like, I've never been there. So Joshua had to make a decision. Do What am I going to do? I'm going to allow fear to determine the destiny. And I want to declare this morning, because I love you this morning, that there are too many of us in this room that fear is telling you your future. And God's like, whoa, 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 stop fear and live in faith. The reason you can live in faith is because God loves you. 
that God has a plan for you. It may not look like your plan. It may not feel like a plan is coming to pass, but He loves you. And the truth is, it may look bad right now, and it may not look like you're going to get over, but there is a higher truth that God is for you. And if you trust Him and you lean into Him, He will get you out of your situation. And that's why you can live with hope. Joshua's thinking all of these things in his life. You see, there were legitimate reasons for him. And today you may be looking at your reality and your reasons are legitimate of why things can't change in your life. And there might be legitimate reasons for you to live in fear, but I want to encourage you what Joshua did was he was able to turn his fear into faith. You know that the only difference between heroes and cowards is that heroes know how to turn fear into faith. Heroes face the same fears that cowards do. They just know how to turn it into faith. You see, the definition of faith and fear is exactly the same thing. Believing something that is not as though it is. That's the same definition. Faith is believing what is. Amen? It's believing now. I don't see it now, but I believe it's coming. That's faith. You know what fear is? It hasn't happened, but I'm believing it's going to happen. It's the same definition. And so how do we turn our faith, our fear into faith? Number one. We've got to seek the Lord. The Bible says that God said to Joshua, meditate on these words. Do not let them leave your lips. So you seek the Lord and you seek God's way. Because whenever you seek God, you know what happens? Fear goes out the door. When you seek God, faith rises. Because you know God is still on the board. You still have another move. The enemy's lied to you. The enemy's deceived you. He's told you there's no future. There's no destiny. But the king is still on the board. And he's saying, come on, make a move. Your next move is you're going to be your greatest move. Your next move is going to determine the direction of your future. You've got to seek the Lord. That's why I love what the psalmist said. I sought the Lord. And he answered me. And he delivered me from all my fears. You want fear to go? Stop agreeing with fear and arguing with faith. You got to start seeking the Lord. Start believing the Lord. When the enemy says, you're not going to make it. When South Africa, everybody is saying, it's over. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to seek the Lord. And he's going to deliver me from all my fears. I'm going to seek the Lord in my darkest hour. And he's going to deliver me from all my fears. We need a church that stops agreeing with what the world is saying. A church that says, you know what? We've sought God. We've seen what's happening out there. And it is true. But we have sought God. And we have a different response. We have a different report. We have a report from the Lord. And so while the whole of South Africa is living in fear, we, the church, live in peace because we have sought the Lord. And whenever you seek the Lord, all your fears are delivered. Why are you living in fear? You know, I battle with fear. And God was saying, Donovan, you're missing out. You're missing out on a world you haven't even seen yet because you're living in fear. I want to encourage business people right now. And people are talking about the recession and the economy, and it's true. Let's not dispute it. It is true. Let me tell you right now, you seek the Lord. You don't only get peace. He only don't, doesn't only deliver you from, his, from your fears. You know what he does? He starts to give you strategy. He starts to give you plans. He starts to give you favor. I'm telling you right now, if you're a business person in this room, I want to encourage you to get up this today and say, you know what, we're putting the fear of the economy aside. We're starting to look to God. We're starting to believe. Let me tell you, let me tell you, if you're in car sales, everybody's, people are buying cars. Let them come to you. If people, if you're in houses, people are looking to buy houses. Let them come to you. If you're a teacher, children need to be educated. Give them your best. Come on, we got to rise up. we got to get out of fear. we got to start believing in faith. we got to say, God, I'm seeking you, Lord. I'm Lord, you're going to deliver me from all my fears. Next thing that you've got to do is you've got to change your perspective. You've got to change your perspective. You see, you've got to see life differently from the world. Because you're not of this world. You've got to see life very differently. While everyone is in fear, discouraged. You've got to realize that your perspective doesn't have to be the same. Because the king is still on the board. You see, when you see life differently, you see, if you, if you don't change your perspective, what you're going to do is you're going to live in a negative mindset. And a negative mindset can never build you a good future. A negative mindset does not come from God. You have to change your perspective. Come on, church. 
I'm speaking to you this morning. Change your perspective. You don't serve a God who abandons his children. You don't serve a God who's given up. You serve a God who's setting all the pieces in place and he's making you, waiting for you to take a step. Change your perspective. Look what it says, Psalm 27. It says, I remain confident in this. Listen, let me just stop there. Whatever you remain in is what you will be. If you remain in negativity, if you remain in doubt, that's what you'll be. The psalmist said this, I remain confident on this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know what he's saying? I'm not waiting to get to heaven to experience the goodness of God. God said I can have heaven on earth. Come on, church. I want to really see the goodness of God in this generation while we're living here in the south of Joburg. That we can do the impossible. That God is on our side. That God has more for us. I'm confident. I'm not doubting. I'm not fearing. God is on my side. I'm confident. I'm confident. I'm confident. When everybody else is battling, heaven has provision. When everybody's doubting, I have faith. Come on, I'm preaching better than you responding this morning. Come on, I'm confident. Doesn't matter what happens, I'm confident. Because my faith is rooted in love. And when you love someone, you want the best for them. Remain. You see, I've got to change my perspective. Because if I don't change my perspective, my circumstance and myself, I won't change. You see, don't allow your circumstance to change your faith. Allow your faith to shape your circumstances. You see, either our theology fits into our reality or our reality confirmed, conforms to our theology. There's too many people like, I've reduced God to my situation. It's time for us to be the church that has boldness, that has faith, that has the belief. You know what? My reality is like this and it's not good, but I'm bringing my God into my reality. And when you bring God into your reality, things are going to change. Because God is not small. God is not fearful. God is not weak. God is strong. God is powerful and He is big. Come on. We should be declaring our God is good in Jesus' name. Change your perspective. Last one is this. Change your, change your fear into faith. You've got to root yourself in God. Because whatever you're rooted in will produce a specific kind of fruit. Colossians 2 says this, let your roots grow down into Him and let your lives be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Got to be rooted. Got to be rooted. We see when you're rooted in Him, your life changes. You're connected to Him. You're connected to His peace. You're connected to His promises. When you're rooted in Him, your fear starts to go. You see, when you're rooted in Him, you, you see, this is the truth. Fear sees challenges as roadblocks. But faith sees challenges as potential and opportunity. And whatever you're rooted in is, will determine how you see it. And how you see it is how you'll live it. And I'm yet to declare, like the psalmist said, I sought the Lord, and He delivered me from all my fears. I sought, I'm declaring over the south of Joburg, over Ramah South Family Church, that we will be delivered from every kind of fear, every kind of evil that the enemy will ever bring against us. Why? Because we seek the Lord. And when we seek the Lord, He delivers us from our field. It is time for the church to make a declaration that faith is our, our means to the kingdom of God, not fear. Right now, right now, I just want us to bow our heads right now. And I, wanna, I, want, you to, I want you to be real. This is you and God. This is destiny. It's your future. This room you say, you know what, Donovan, I battle with fear. I want you to raise your hand right now. I want you to raise your hand right now and believe that today, from today onwards, not today. You've, some of you have been living the lie of the enemy. God says, I've got more for you. You've got to look beyond that. You've got to make a move. Father, I pray for every hand, every woman. Every man in this room, Lord, let's raise their hand. Father God, we know how real fear can be, Lord. Lord, we know how it can paralyze our future, Lord. Paralyze us in the moment, making decisions for our lives. 
So God, we take authority over this fear now in the name of Jesus. We know that in our own strength, we cannot defeat it. But with the power of your Holy Spirit, with the work of Jesus Christ at the cross, we have won. So Father God, I pray right now, Lord, that we would focus on you, Lord, and that we continue to seek you, Lord. And Father, I thank you that all fear, anxiety, depression, discouragement, doubt, whatever it is, Lord, that's over our lives, we take authority over it now. In the name of Jesus, we thank you that we have been set free, that we are no longer slaves to fear, but we are children of the living God. And Father, we declare that we are victorious in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.